So a wonderful way to start our afternoon. And now we go into a panel, so the panel can start to move this way. And I look around and I consider this a compliment. The reason that you won't need an introduction to the panel MC is because I consider you as an audience peak RNZ. <laughs> so the challenge you'll have is that you'll see the face for a change unless you're looking on social media and you'll know the voice. What you may not know is that she was also the International Radio Personality of the Year. Yes, International Radio Personality of the Year in 2012. Uh, but she is someone who is renowned in many ways for asking all the right questions in the best ways that I personally love. So please welcome our panel MC, Kim Hill. Kira, thank you. Um, we're here to discuss the pros and cons of philanthropic investment. We all on the same page here, jolly good. And of course, who could argue with philanthropy? The desire to promote the welfare of others by the generous donation of money to good causes. In the United States, where gazillions of dollars are generously given, the virtues of philanthropy have become tainted by for example, the Sackler family, who made billions boosting consumption of OxyContin, fueling the opioid epidemic while also giving a lot of money for, quote, a better world, unquote. In the 1880s, Andrew Carnegie, possibly the richest American who ever lived, gave vast endowments to universities and famously public libraries. His money came from railroads and steel and from, as it's been described, ruthlessly exploiting his employees. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that philanthropy always has a dark side or is always about image laundering. But <laughs> does it matter where the money comes from if it's going to a good cause? And in New Zealand, with the ambitious goal of predator-free New Zealand bearing down on us, as well as the environmental problems generally that we face, can we afford to be fussy about who's funding the effort? These are the unpleasant skeptical hypotheticals that I'm kind of trained to think about, but then I'm not at the impoverished, sharp end of our efforts to salvage our biodiversity and improve our science, although Radio New Zealand always accepts checks. <laughs> Doesn't, actually. Sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> we can't even accept checks. The members of our panel today are, however, <laughs> Experts in that area, some brief introductions, as you will no doubt know them already. Political scientist Zara Hamid, prominent here and overseas, on the issues of indigenous cultural and intellectual property and sustainable development. She's just returned from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, familiarly known as ISPPBES. <laughs> In Paris, <laughs> which unsurprisingly concluded that nature is decreasing at an alarming rate and that indigenous people have a particular role to play in reversing that trend. Professor Bruce Clarkson of the University of Waikato leads the program aiming to restore nature in urban environments, where 87% of New Zealanders live, by the way. He's one of New Zealand's foremost authorities on ecological restoration. And he asks, what if cities are seen not as a problem, but the solution to saving biodiversity? And of course, that's where the rich people live, right? Natalie Whitaker has been a philanthropy enabler for a long time, even though she looks only 14 years old. <laughs> <laughs> she founded New Zealand's first crowdfunding site, Give a Little, in 2007. It was subsequently sold to the charitable arm of Spark, which now funds give a little to the tune, I think, of around $800,000. She doesn't know. <laughs> Since then, she has been trying to, as she put it to me a little earlier, I said, well, figure out how to get access to money. <laughs> right. Good luck to you. Um, give a little raise $2.3 million to keep our Awaroa Beach public. Government contributed uh, $350,000, I think. That was a, a major media splash. Whether it was a good idea or not, I don't know. Ah, 
Jan Hania helps run Next Foundation, a privately funded New Zealand philanthropic foundation. It was established by Neil and Annette Plowman in 2014. And it had a mandate to invest, has a mandate, to invest $100 million over 10 years into environmental and educational projects. Jan's also director of Taranaki Maunga, the ecological restoration of the Maunga and its neighboring peaks. Professor Sean Hendy, his day job is physics and nanotechnology. He's the director of Te Punaha Matatini, a center of research excellence hosted by the University of Auckland. And an outspoken commentator on the need for scientists to speak out on environmental issues or anything else, come to that. He was a close colleague of the late Sir Paul Callaghan, who, of course, expression crazy and ambitious gives the title to this conference. Have you stopped flying yet, Sean, or started flying yet? More to the point. I'm back flying again. You're yes. back flying again, yeah. Have plane. you given up eating meat? S sorry? Have you given up eating meat? <laughs> no. No, just checking your credentials. No, no. <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> I'm um, working all right, on welcome it. to all our panel, please, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I, are you all, one way or another, in receipt of philanthropic funding? Is anybody not in receipt of philanthropic funding? You are not? Currently not. At this moment in time, not. No. But I hope to be. Yeah. See, see Natalie afterwards. <laughs> Just let, tell me about what you're doing, Natalie, at the moment, because it seems to go not to the heart of philanthropy, but as you and Jan were explaining to me earlier, what sort of comes next? Explain. Okay, sure. Um, I, in my experience with Give a Little, I came to um, understand intimately how New Zealanders give and why. And uh, at the end of an eight-year period running, running Give a Little, I, I sort of felt a little underwhelmed. Like people would pat me on the back and say, you know, that's an amazing thing that you've done. Don't you feel great? And actually I felt really deflated. Um, and I couldn't, work, I couldn't work out why. And it was really because actually the experience that I had with Give a Little proved to me that as a country we're very generous, but we're really generous when it comes to spotting problems, when it's all too late. And we do a really poor job of investing together in opportunities and in solutions. And um, this became almost a bit of an obsession for me when I probably should have been relaxing a little bit and <laughs> decided to work out how it is that we need to, to kind of find more, more funding that can more neutrally attach to outcomes. And uh, that's taken me down a mine shaft and in a collaboration with Sean and another, three other really amazing co-founders to understand the role that data plays in basically building the case to invest earlier before all of the problems are manifest. So uh, Louise uh, pointed out just in the last speech that there's a, a, a vast amount of capital that's starting to pull in the financial markets for impact. Some specifically, you know, some funds specifically for impact investment, but a whole lot of capital. Can I? Moved can I? Yeah. Would you? What is impact investment? Is this a, a new 21st century expression? I'm going to pass that to Jan. Jan, <laughs> impact investment. I'll give it a crack. You know, I think what we're talking about is how we measure the return on an investment to achieve the outcome that you're hoping to solve. So, for instance. If you were looking to remove predators or bring back species in this particular environment, what is the cost and how do you know that you've achieved it and when will you know you've got there? You can't manage what you can't measure. So measuring impact is critical for investors and people who manage these things to achieve these outcomes. Why is that so hard? Well, where do we start? <laughs> uh, there are so many dimensions which are variable in the environmental sector. Nature is a complex ecosystem, a complex web of things going on. Your interventions can only be at points and places in a different parts of an evolution of, a, of an ecosystem web. What we do here may not have a direct impact here, but we need to be able to measure how our investment can make an impact at some point, and then we can invest some more to see which way we're trending in terms of our investment return. You know how to ask these questions, right? I don't see any questions coming up on the screen, but if anybody asks a question, I'll just see it in front of me, will I? Yes. Jolly good. Arrow, yeah. you're, you're shifting yeah, in your I seat. <laughs> I guess I have a kind of different take on philanthropy because as a concept, it 
gives a preferential status to those who give money over those who give time. And I really would like to just acknowledge that one in three New Zealanders volunteers their time. And I, I looked up before I came an estimated 157 million hours of voluntary time is spent by New Zealanders every year, which comes to about $3.46 billion of voluntary labour. And this country and every other country could not exist without the philanthropy of time that people give. And we should never underestimate its importance. But I also think that philanthropy is not a neutral um, space. It's a very colonial um, background to it. And what we don't want to see happening as we move into the future is the, as they call them, the ph philanthropic capitalists who are just using the market, which is the same market that has caused so much of the environmental problems that we have now as a way of trying to do good, that if we can't use philanthropy to fundamentally shift power, who is involved in projects, and give more voice to communities, to volunteers, to tangata whenua, then all we're doing is more of the same. You put it very well in, in I don't know, is, is it, was it in Paris that you said that nature's decline is driven by a predominant yeah economic and political system that flavors, that favors increasing consumption and growth over living in harmony with nature. Yeah. And we were actually able to get that statement through 165 countries trying to make sure that it was edited out. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at all the scientific evidence, capitalism has been a major factor in why we're experiencing environmental decline right across the globe and in unprecedented numbers. So we can't look to that same value system, uh, be it in government or be it in NGOs or be it in the uh, philanthropic. Well, in that case, you wouldn't take any philanthropic money, right? You what would, am I thinking of? Tyndall Foundation. Yeah. You know, reliant for its wealth on, you know, huge shops selling stuff that people don't really need. Yeah. I mean, that <laughs> goes to the heart of your criticism, doesn't it? I need everything that I buy. <laughs> <laughs> As how, many, consumer, how many pairs of shoes have you got, really? <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. You can't, if we are too critical of the system, then we don't take any money and we're left in the crap. I think the scale of the problem, though, is so huge. We do need everyone to contribute, but we don't need more of the same. We need different ways of doing things. So I think it's beholden upon the philanthropists to not walk in and say, we have the answer, and this is the structure, and this is how we're going to do it. It's now we need to learn how to walk in and say, what is the question? Uh, is there really a mandate for us to be here? And then what is the structure or way that we can actually create the space for this to be answered? Um, Bruce, I want to get your take on philanthropy because you have oceans of it washing through your door, don't you? I just came back from the US on a trip where I was funded by philanthropy. Yeah? Um, Where'd uh, you go, Las Vegas? Missouri Botanical Garden. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't go to Las Vegas on the strip. I went to Missouri Botanical Garden, actually, yeah. for a workshop on health, human health and urban restoration and the interplay between the two things. Um, it's really interesting listening to my colleagues here. Such interesting takes, right? I'm really interested in it. We'll get to the question in a minute, yeah. Because I, I made up a little list of the things to watch out for in philanthropy, because in my role at the University of Waikato, every year we bring in approximately, well, more, more than, in fact, $5 million a year in philanthropic funding. But it's an extremely broad, I mean, philanthropy is extremely broad. It can range from somebody knocking on your door and saying, here's the cash, do what you like with it, through to people who come in and expect you to develop a very tight-knit contract to deliver some outcomes of the nature that Jan was describing, and everything in between. And so I've, I've got some thoughts about what makes a good philanthropist, and I've also got some thoughts about things to watch out for with philanthropy, which we may get to eventually, but I thought I would just comment first on what I th think makes a good philanthropist and it's not the one that walks in the door and just gives you the cash. Surprisingly, people might think that's what I might like. 
but actually it's the one that wants to form a relationship with you which focuses on delivering some form of impact where you can work together and learn from each other to actually deliver something of significance. And in, in my case, if it's a project to do with restoring nature, then it's right at the top of the list. And I will work with any philanthropist to make sure that we could deliver on that sort of funding. On, on the basis that if you work with the philanthropist, it increases the volume of the cash. No, you've, it, you've got the, the dialogue going on. Yeah, so you, there's public and private money available, and philanthropy is critical often for top-up. We simply do not have enough funding in New Zealand to do, deliver all the ecological um, benefits that we need to restore nature. We just don't have to. So the question is, how do we put together portfolios of funding in order to, to deliver the result that we're seeking? So, you know, I think it's really important that we do think carefully about how we use philanthropy. And um, there is, uh, some people have sometimes referred to ph philanthropy as a form of dancing with the devil. My, my view is that it's actually not, not to that extent a problem because everyone has the right of refusal. And I have on a number of occasions exercised the right of refusal. Who have you refused and why? And that is because <laughs> when they come in the door with the big cheque and say to you, will you prove this? Will you provide evidence for that? Will you find the answer which helps me advance my private cause? And as a scientist immediately, I've got a problem with that. So those are the sorts of rights. Do you get that too, Sean? Uh, not, not so much. No, I don't, I don't have a lot of people turning up, <laughs> handing over checks. Um, uh, but, I but I mean, in general sense, yeah, people look, funding science or investigations that they want the right answer I to. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 you know, that government funding, which is the, these days the largest form of funding, often comes with those kind of caveats, right? Mm. When, you're, when you're working with a, a ministry, perhaps getting direct funding from that ministry, there's often pressure, you know, and you're aware that... that, that people's careers depend on some of the answers coming out certain ways. One of the questions kind of goes to that issue in a way. Is there a danger that philanthropic funding can skew or undermine priorities determined by other potentially carefully thought out processes? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think for, for sure. I mean, it's science actually, I mean, for, we've been in bed with philanthropists for a very long time, actually. That's prior to, you know, we've only had government funding for science for around about 100 years. Before then, it was pretty much all philanthropic funding. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and so the priorities were very much determined by, by you know, rich white people in the UK and you just have to go to the Natural History Museum <laughs> in, in, in London or the British Museum to see what they were up to. You know, they were going out and they were taking stuff back to, to the UK. Um, and so we've, we've, we've had this complicated relationship for a long time, I think, with, with funding and it does, we've got to accept that it does... Um, you know, it changes our priorities and it determines the types of questions that we can ask. Um, questions for Aro Haranyan, because uh, essentially what Aro was suggesting a little earlier, specifically what strategies should we use to decolonise philanthropy? What, is, what does that expression mean to you, Jan, decolonising philanthropy? So that's a, a question about equity, I think, and ensuring that you can reconcile equity in these projects and in these processes that we're developing. And as I was saying earlier, it's not turning up with an answer, it's turning up uh, questioning whether you have a mandate to be there in the first place, and then what are the questions that need to be answered from that community, and then working alongside that community as to how you're going to solve it. So that would be one way. And I think also philanthropy, uh, as, a, as an industry, as an entity, needs to realise it's only one player in a community, alongside Māori, alongside government, alongside other NGOs, and especially alongside communities. No one player is going to solve these complex, wicked problems that we're dealing with. But together, with the diversity of the approaches and learnings from those various sectors, and, 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 and sort of you know, making equal, bringing equity to the solution, can you actually have some way of going forward? Uh -huh. uh, I think one of the important uh, things to, to change is an explicit acknowledgement that culture, social, economics, environment, spiritual are all interrelated. So when projects are being developed, um, all of these are equally important. And if philanthropic investment is all pushed into one area at the expense of the others, then you end up with quite a skew results. You might save a species, but in the process you might have 
um, diminished the livelihoods of people, or you might have have dramatically altered the the uh, landscape. But also, we need to be looking at not just sharing power, but transferring power from central governments to communities, to Māori in specific. We are in the state we are in in New Zealand, even though we are one of the countries that has the highest percentage of conservation estate for the land. Why are our species continuing to decline? Because that those weren't the main areas that had the species, but also they weren't being managed. And so we, we've developed a culture of ownership. We as in the crown, so not me. Um, very good at owning, very good at controlling access, not good at managing, and not good at being a good caretaker. So if we don't shift that fundamental mindset that the best people to take care of our amazing environment, our Tonga species, is us, the people. It's actually not government. And we shouldn't look to government to be the one to give all these solutions. That idea of, 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 of a certain amount of money or effort skewing things away from other areas um, goes to a question that we have here. Is philanthropic investment in conservation in New Zealand too single species focused? You know, got your charismatic megafauna. Uh, or do iconic species serve the purpose of attracting investment that would otherwise not be given? And, you know, we look at the Kākāpō, we look at, at the Pūtukāwa project, Crimson. Do any of you, let me ask you, Bruce, because you've had dealings with this, yeah. is that a problem? Well, one of the things about this is that it, um, if you study ecosystems, of course, you can take a view that by picking an umbrella or a focal species that, um, and attracting the money using that focal species, you are then providing benefit to a wider landscape or a wider ecosystem. So yeah. it does come down to how you define the, the um, objectives of your project. You mean I, nothing wrong with marketing? Well, I wouldn't be picking the mice, but for, so for example... No. But Save if, if, the it mice. Was, if it was bellbird or tui or if it was, you know, some other uh, native bird, there's a very good chance that if you put investment into protecting that population and reducing the predators, that you're going to get other spill-off spill benefits. And so it, you have to be a bit careful about not making it a, you know, a black and white scenario. Um, we had a similar question in the previous panel, which was talking about the skewing of how... Um, how conservation and restoration approaches problems in New Zealand by focusing on predators, does that, does that skew the system? Um, my view on that is that there has been a, a bit of a shift and a bit of a skewing of the system because along the way somewhere we tend to have forgotten the importance of high quality habitat, restoring habitat and rebuilding habitat. And I would say that those uh, elements are, are different sides of the same coin. Um, well, I, you mean you could you could resurrect the mammoth, but where are you going to push it? Well, so for example, you can uh, kill the pests <laughs> in an urban environment and still um, uh, generate a very good, healthy bird population, but the bird population is surviving by living on parklands and exotic trees, while the other components of the indigenous ecosystem are still being reduced. So, you, again, it's a, it's a question of having a clear idea about what you're trying to achieve with your project. Um, and if, if the consequence of the predator removal in an urban setting is that we only get the birds, then I would say we haven't done the proper job. Yeah, but I mean, if you're trying to get philanthropic money to something, mm. you, you, you have to say, don't you? If you give us this money, then we will see this measurable return, right? Yep. And if you're arguing for the recreation of an entire ecosystem, mm -hmm. phew, that's way down the track, and it's not going to... Uh, no, no, we're already doing it, actually. Come to Hamilton sometime, and I'll show you. All right. <laughs> so it's, it's not, it doesn't get too complicated that it becomes impossible. No, it's I don't feasible. believe so. All right. I don't believe so. All right. um, anybody, any farmer knows that if you close the back paddock and stop putting the top dressing on, that you can actually recreate a, an indigenous forest ecosystem quite quickly in New Zealand, if you're in the right climatic zone, that is. In, in, in terms of philanthropy, um, there's a question here, is there not scope to help teachers financially 
This sounds like a self-serving question to me, but I'll run it through. <laughs> I'll run it through the panel. Is there not scope to help teachers financially to engage more with environmental restoration education through philanthropy? I can answer that, yes. Yeah. Because the university yeah. gets philanthropic money all of the time to support particular programs, of educational programs, and also to support um, development of masters and PhD students. So yes, that is happening already. I guess the questioner may be more interested in secondary school or primary or whatever, but I believe there are similar programs out there. For example, I think Air New Zealand gives money for primary school um, programs relating to environment. The, the ethical issue of philanthropic money, and it's not so severe here because less money goes to philanthropic causes than in America where literally billions and billions and billions goes, thereby depriving the government of a certain amount of taxation, right? I mean, there's, it's not a win-win a necessarily philanthropy. And there's a question there that if the tax system worked, much of the philanthropic money would be in the hands of elected representatives. Is, is that not better? I mean, we're taking money from people who should have paid it in taxes, perhaps. Does that enter into our calculations here? You're nodding, Natalie. Well, I think uh, part of the issue is that we have to um, ask what the motivations of the philanthropy is. We have a real challenge, I think, joining, uh, joining the, the idea of philanthropy motivating the public to take greater responsibility if that philanthropy has been sourced through a, a controversial activity. I think the public really need to see high integrity from the philanthropic endeavours if they're, they're going to mobilise their efforts and their resources behind it. But I, I do think that um, there, there is a bit of a challenge there, for sure, um, if we're wanting to make sure that we can maximise the results that we get from the philanthropy, for sure. And, of course, the more money that you take through philanthropy, the more you enable the government to say, well, you don't need that bit of taxpayers' money, do you? So... This, this is true. This is true. I think it's really problematic that uh, we're told, you know, on a three-year cycle to trot off to the polls and vote the parties that represent our morals and values. Um, and we, we hope that the, that the government of the day will be able to take bold action uh, that, that affirms that decision that we've made. Um, but we often see philanthropy being able to come out with the big wins and do the bold things that, that kind of uh, want to attach to our hearts. And I think it's, there is a bit of a democratic challenge here that we have with, with philanthropy is that we, we do need to make sure that the philanthropy is actually listening to what the public wants, um, not just what the philanthropist wants as well. Because if we want to really affirm um, and, and mobilise the, the public, we need, to, we need to align with that. I, I asked Bruce this. He said he had no problem because he could whisk up a biodiversity environment in no time at all <laughs> in Hamilton. <laughs> But I there didn't, is, I didn't say there no is a question. <laughs> hey, how do those who work for long-term systems, attitudinal and policy changes show impact? It can take decades to affect these changes. And that's quite right. Any comment on you, on, on that from you? Yeah, so impact assessment doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, to show the impact immediately at all. In fact, the, the biological heritage challenge is is an exact example of how many of the impacts that come from the work being undertaken in the challenge may not be realised for several generations. No, but I mean, there is a serious concern that, that predator-free New Zealand 2050 is not going to happen unless there's a massive attitudinal change. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm reading between the lines, and it's saying, yeah. we haven't got a hope in hell, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not really an expert in predator-free New Zealand, but I can say that in many long-term systems, like in terms of reconstructing a native forest or whatever, that you can show stages of impact along the way. So there are ways of monitoring the system to show that you meet critical thresholds where you're starting to get a healthy functioning system back and progressively you're building the diversity and richness of the community and um, that you're, you're heading in the right direction. So I don't believe that you need to demonstrate impact immediately. And I'm sure that Jan's in a similar position with his project Maunga that um, you can't expect that there, there will be a delivery of the ultimate goal 
uh, that, that is an intergenerational thing. You know, we're talking intergenerational projects here, but you can measure things along the way and take a stage-based approach to monitoring and demonstrate that you're on the right trajectory to getting the result that you need. Mm. Arohar, any comment on that? Well, I think it's important to set bold visions. Mm. Um, we need them as a generation to be able to say to the generations that come behind us that we stood for something, that we tried to do something. Um, and really, once you start on on that pathway, you don't fail. You may not reach your original target, but you can't say you've failed because you've achieved things along that way. And I'd actually like us to see, I'd like to see more bold visions being uh, put out there for us because that's what inspires people to action and to change. They can't be just aspirational though, can they? They no, have to I be mean, in some way achievable. There's got to be some, some standing behind it. I mean, one of the visions that was made some years ago in Ngāpai o Te Maramatanga, which is the Māori Centre oh. Research Excellence, was to create 200 Māori PhDs. And I remember reporting that to the Commerce Board at Victoria University when I was there, and my colleagues all burst out laughing and just said, oh, don't be silly. Why would you set a target like that? You know, why don't you go for something achievable like two or three a Incrementalism. year. Incrementalism. And in any event, we're up to 600 Māori PhDs now. So, y you know, you set a bold vision, you get a bold outcome. So. I think, I mean, there's also intent to measure, right? And, yeah. and, and intent to pass that learning yeah. on to future mm. generations. Um, and so, so monitoring as you go, yeah. um, you know, even if you've got big, bold visions, you know, putting putting down the way markers as you go and, and passing those learnings on to future generations, even in long-term challenges, I think there's there's real value in that. And we, we so often don't do it. We'd like to think we do, but often the self, you know, everything happens when the check gets handed over, um, and then we all go back to doing what we were doing before. And there's very little record kept of, of what actually happened. Right, and and I take Arahas point that she made earlier that philanthropy is seen to be, you know, lashings of cash, but all the volunteers that work on the environment at the moment, or anything else, are in effect philanthropists giving their time. And in fact, the recent report on the, on the, uh, the Bioheritage Challenge says that um, practically 100% public support is necessary for predator-free New Zealand by 2050, apart from anything else. And that's been tested here in Wellington in a quite sophisticated way, and it's 94%. And only those people who, who, who haven't agreed are ones who just want a little bit more. It's getting, it's growing, and it's growing by the But 94% doing something or 94% saying, gosh, I'm glad my neighbour's doing something. 94% <laughs> who agree with the outcome. But let's talk well, about... Well, who doesn't agree with the outcome? But you've well, got to put your... You'd be surprised. You've got to put your... <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you've also got to do... You can't just say, gosh, that's a good idea. You have to put a bit of yourself up there, don't and you? And you need a way to find your, your place in doing something in a way that suits your situation as well. And I think that leads to another part of the conversation, which is what are all the other consequences and all the other outcomes that are achieved by being part of a, of a larger movement? You're building community resilience, you're building capability, you're, you're building connectivity, you're building capacity. Social, social capacity overall is building because you're connecting towards a common goal that no one individually could achieve on their own. So what we should, I mean, I take it that you all think that more philanthropic money should be going to environmental issues. Um, the stats are that something like 3% of our philanthropic money goes to environmental issues at the moment and something like 19, 20% goes to sport and recreation. So you all think... No, Natalie doesn't quite think that. Mm. Oh, no, I definitely do. In terms of a proportion of current philanthropy, I think we need to start seeing as a major swing towards environmental. But taking development. away from what? Uh, well, not a zero sum game. Yeah, I don't. I would hate to say what, but I do think that if we don't start waking up to the reality that the environment is the foundation of of everything, right. then then we're in big trouble. Um, I just think that we, we do have to challenge the economics, though, as well. We can't say that this is just a job for philanthropy. We have to actually keep asking questions about how, how the market is going to change. How are we going to challenge 
capitalist ideals, how are we going to see the job of kaitiaki actually a, a, a paid job in our future economy? Because if we don't start asking and actually finding, actively designing ways for people to be paid for these important things, then we are going to continue to rely on the philanthropy of money or time. And it's just far too important for that. And it's not one or the other. You know, this yeah. conference seems about fucking money. Yeah. And so how can we do environmental stuff and yet recognise the health benefits, both physical and mental, in doing so? Yeah. How can, can you also realise those social impacts that are being achieved while you're doing um, collective environmental work at the same time? You fuck a mana, all your entities in your, in your community, you're all better off. So, you know, philanthropies, government, yeah. but also yeah. communities, and, and also new types of institutions, new ways of getting people together. Yeah. I think they're all going to be really important. We don't want to have too much piecemeal stuff, though, do we? I mean, we all need to be looking roughly in the same direction. Sometimes it's pretty confusing. There are an awful lot of agencies and organisations and who knows what. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think p part of that problem solving will be new ways of organising ourselves, mm. new ways of bringing together piecemeal efforts. I mean, you know, Give a, look at, give a Little is an example of that where mm. people can chip in a small amount um, mm. to create something bigger than the sum of its parts. And so I think we need to, f we, you know, we do need to find new ways of doing things. Sorry, Bruce, you wanted to say? Well, I was just going to say, uh, reflecting on some comments to my left, it, it's about how you define environment. People are part of the environment. Mm. Um, human health is part of the environment. The workshop that I've just been to is one which is trying to make the connection between human health and ecological restoration through the uh, current work on what's called microbiome. You know, the whole point about having proper microbiomes in cities where children are exposed to dirt, basically, are able to go outside and do stuff, which then pr helps their health because they don't have immunity problems and they don't develop asthma because they're surrounded by pine plantations instead of having rich, diverse ecosystems nearby, green space nearby. So I think it's important that we take a holistic view of the environment and the way people fit within it, because actually when we start saying, oh, can we shift more money to environment, what do we mean by environment? We must, must take a broad view. Mm. Um, there's a question. Uh, will philanthropic investment bodies welcome the idea of an independent body of scientists nominated by scientists across the CRIs and Murray groups? <laughs> No, to evaluate, blah, blah, blah. You probably know who that's from. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't even know what it means. Do we Independent have a body. challenge, yes. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Do, is there a place for environmental offsetting and what environmental trade-offs should we accept when trying to promote a strong economy? Environmental offsetting... Um, I don't know whether that you consider that to be a distraction... Or a, or, a, or a valid tactic? Well, uh, some people call it environmental compensation. That's a broader view which includes mitigation, includes uh, biodiversity off offsetting or whatever it might be. My view, and having participated in many um, negotiations around environmental offsetting, at the, is at the moment in New Zealand we do not have the right ingredients in place to do fair trades for the environment. Mm. I've just been involved in a subdivision hearing where essentially people are saying that by planting a few trees over a period of three to five years, that will mitigate the uh, potential damage done to a local bat population. It's, it's just not a fair trade. So the rules are clear. There are good published international papers on criteria that would be applied for environmental offsetting, but I'm unaware of any model example in New Zealand yet where this has been done well. Right. So it's tokenism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see it differently. I think if we don't start the conversation around costing the environment, then we, we, we stop the conversation about valuing it. So we need to see, we need to see more offsetting um, and we need to see um, more quantification of the, the, the trade-offs that are currently um, in play in the market. And who's going to do that, Sean? Well, I, mean, I'm just, I was just going to add that we kind of have no choice with, with climate change, right? I mean, that, Offsetting is, is a big part of our strategy for combating climate change, so we do have to we do have to get to grips with this with this idea. I, I mean, I must admit, you know, my, in my no-fly year, lots of people talked to me and um, said, "Well, why don't why don't you just offset um, uh, your your air miles?" And well, it's because we you know because we lack this good framework for doing that at the moment. How we get there? Well, um, uh, science will play a big role in that. I think I think we do have to. Um, as, as scientists, we're going to have to 
uh, get in and um, and develop methods that let us do that. Why is is offsetting offsetting is dealing only with with the carbon dioxide, right? The greenhouse gases. Is it consistent with our biodiversity needs? Or is it a completely different thing? And if so, why? I mean, I think, and I'll probably get shot down here, not being an environmental scientist. I mean, I think, and, and, you know, the carbon cycle is something that's relatively well understood. I mean, it's a, it is a complex system, but we have a you know, a bit of a sense of, of that. I mean, we can trace the carbon that we're pulling out of the ground, the fossil carbon, and we can track it through the environment. I think biodiversity is a much more complicated, um, uh, you, you know, it, it depends on a much more complicated system. Um, and so, you know, I've yet to see really good ways, um, or at least as a, as a physicist, I haven't been convinced yet that we're on top of that problem. All right. Um, a perfect example, Bruce, of what I cannot remember but you will, um, is Mahu Whenua, our first private national park and philanthropist, Mutlanga. Do you yes. support this sort of initiative? What is that about? Uh, so that's a national park that's been set up in the South Island by the um, millionaire, is he, or billionaire, or a millionaire, Matt, Matt Lange. Um, um, so he's essentially set aside as, I think, the largest Queen Elizabeth II covenant in the country, um, equivalent to a national park. And y yes, the answer is of course, but, but then the question becomes um, what is public access like? What are, what are, are there any caveats around the use or uh, for recreation or harvest or whatever you might want, you know, traditional harvest? So the answer is uh, ye yes, but let's see the details about uh, what access is like for the public. I, I, one of uh, the the great hailed acts of a rich visiting American <laughs> is Cape Kidnappers in Hawke's Bay. Um, and I, I don't wish to issue any criticism of it. Um, Julian Robertson, you know, decided it was a great place and he built a predator-free fence around it. He was a, a true philanthropist and everybody loved him. Is he maintaining it is a question that has been raised. Um, and I think the answer is no. I think the answer is that the gesture was made and the follow-up is, is not necessarily there. And I'm wondering whether a lot of philanthropic effort is along those lines. The big gesture, and everybody says, oh, thank you very much, but the heart is not there to continue with it. So I can speak to that, you know, maybe at that place, I'm not sure the detail is exactly right there, but look what it's inspired. Not only did he invest in that particular peninsula and try some things there, but what's followed on from there has been um, Potereo or Tane and then Cape to City, which is a number of sanctuaries and, and, and um, ecological places around the Hawke's Bay, which collectively can do far more than, than one place on their own. So from Hawke's Bay to Mahia, the Kaweka, and all those places could be joined ecologically soundly, started by the work those guys did there. Um, but who's going to join them? Like, who's in charge? <laughs> well, that's a community <laughs> collective question, and I know that the Cape to City whānau that are here are working with iwi, are working with councils, and are working with other philanthropists, and with DOC also, to deliver a, a network of outcomes across that whole landscape. Um, how can we encourage philanthropy to build a nine, a number nine, wire fence at the top of the conservation cliff? <laughs> I, 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 you know, is the fruit in that question for any of you? So one of the strategies that, that we're using and, and we're building with other partners around the country is a, is a set of um, large landscape scale restoration projects. Predator Free 2050 is jumping in behind them and there are uh, you know, Taranaki, Maunga, Te Manuhuna, Aoraki, Mackenzie Country, others that are being thought about in Stewart Island, Auckland Islands, elsewhere, Predator Free Wellington, which together could potentially secure all the biodiversity in New Zealand or at least have lifeboats to hold it until we figure out how to do it better. And what, do you need more money for that? Always you need more money for that. It's actually not really a question of money. It's a question of modes of delivery and capability and real question of trust. How do you build collectives of trust at the places where these projects are? What does that mean? Why is it an issue of trust? Because you need to actually trust the, as was mentioned earlier, trust the philanthropists, have trust in the delivery outcomes of those people doing the work, and, and also have, you know, so iwi who, who actually are kaitiaki at these places uh, are, are part of that equation and part of the, the governance of these projects. Yeah, Aroha. 
Yes, how can you tell? <laughs> yeah, I, um, one, of the, one of the many things that came out of the, the IFBES report, the Global Assessment on the State of the World's Biodiversity, is that those areas that have maintained high, high mm -hmm. biodiversity are largely in indigenous mm -hmm. territories. And it isn't coincidental that that is where they are because in those territories, people and nature coexist. And even within conservation science, one of the, I mean, there's a moving field that is proving that you get better conservation outcomes when people are directly involved and interacting with nature. So I, I kind of question as an approach this continuation of just declaring um, national parks and protected areas in perpetuity with, with no real management um, mm -hmm. behind it. Because well, that was what I was worrying about, yeah, really. No, exactly, because you do... I mean, our ultimate goal here is not just about the environment, it's about the next generation of people coming through, our descendants, who can connect with the environment and all the species that we have been able to enjoy. And if we keep locking them up, they're not going to be able to achieve that. They need to live alongside them, work out for themselves what it's like to live with species, to help species, to, to manage their own activities, to minimise the, the damage to species. That's all part of what a normal life should be like. Is it, is it not fair to say, I don't know who's best equipped to answer this question, that a lot of our species are essentially not equipped to live alongside us at all and never will be because we're, we're alien, we're too alien. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly true, but um, there are certainly many species that require their own spaces and that's fine. Um, but I still think we can achieve better conservation outcomes by changing the governance that we have of our conservation estate. And of course, this is what you're on to, Bruce, isn't yeah. it? That you want to put nature where people are, essentially. Yeah, but I'm not using it as a substitute for also having really good reserves in the back country, yeah. national parks and on Both. offshore islands. So what I'm doing really is taking the approach that it's actually one big system. Mm. And if we're ever going to be successful in protecting biodiversity in Aotearoa New Zealand, we need to do it across a range of different landscapes. And in order to, I guess, have engaged members of the public, to have children in particular reconnected with the environment, unless it's in their own backyard, many of them will never even get the chance to experience it. Um, this question goes to what I was talking about with Araho a little earlier. Why trust local communities to protect the environment more than you trust the government? After all, we are the people who drive the capitalist system that does so much environmental damage. And we're all implicated, we're all guilty, we're all part of the system. So who amongst us can throw any stones? Oh, some have more power than others. <laughs> you, can be, you can be part of a system, but not necessarily by choice. Just because you don't have power, Araha, doesn't mean that your intentions are necessarily any better than anybody else's. It doesn't imply morality. In itself, that's quite true. All right. But we, we can certainly go a lot further in exploring that as a viable option to what we currently have, which we can see is not working. All right. The, the sense I'm getting from, from some of you at least is that the idea of philanthropy sh should not, we tend to put it in a special kind of circle occupied by rich people <laughs> who have loads of money to spare. Your experience, Natalie, is that that's not necessarily the case, that lots can come from many people. You question motivation, that's another thing. But we should, we should broaden the definition of philanthropy to include what anybody can do. Yeah. Is this correct? I think this is correct. I think the other thing is making sure we see giving on a continuum. Because um, the, and I, I developed this kind of way of thinking about it when I was managing Give a Little. Was this, giving kind of sits on a maturity continuum and you need to invite people on at every point that they are ready. So if they're motivated by 
uh, reputation or the social dynamic of being seen to be giving to something important, you need to take that, embrace it, and ask them to move along on the journey with you. If they're motivated by outcomes and, uh, I guess, reports and proof that their money was the most efficient money in the, in the system or that you're operating with, then you take that and you, and you ask them to move along on the journey with you. But ultimately, where we all need to get to is a place where we're starting to have implicit trust that the things that we're working on are of high value and so that we start to give our money with less condition, but then move into kind of standing alongside one another and seeing the philanthropists be catalysts and then ultimately standing alongside us all on the ground and taking direct responsibility. And so we have to sort of see this as starting from one place but moving along the chain. And I think that that's um, probably the... The, the way that I, I most like to think about philanthropy is on that continuum. You're assuming we're all heading in the same direction. Yeah, but I think we ultimately are <laughs> because we all face the same threat and, um, and if we don't start having a conversation about that threat, you, you know more at threat to environmental degradation and climate change if you're rich than if you're poor. So I think if we start having that conversation, then we can line up in the same direction. Make them feel bad, they won't give you any money. Oh, no, that's not necessarily the case either. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tactic. <laughs> um, the true voice we're not hearing is that of our youth, says mm. a member of the audience. Uh, what about integrating the fight for biodiversity into something like Fortnite? Which is a thought. I can speak directly to this. I Please just do. came from um, a hackathon in Gisborne over the weekend. Uh, where they're facing the, the decline of the Rokumara forest and yeah. like, trying to understand how to deploy uh, the, um, I guess, quite sparse population um, on the East Cape uh, for that challenge. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the families there on the weekend said, well, if we could only program a drone to Fortnite and you know allow our kids to get in there with <laughs> with that, that would be really that would be really interesting. Um, we just have to watch out that they didn't start you know, trying to take each other's drones out in the process. <laughs> but um, I think th there is definitely something in this. I just don't think we, we need to be thinking about the values that we want to perpetuate and make sure those are the values that we, we actually need to see um, preserved because I'm not sure that Fortnite's very deep in deep. value. Yeah. <laughs> no, possibly not. Um, if there was an area, and let, let's talk about the environment specifically, if there was an area of the environment, of predator-free New Zealand, of biodiversity, any of that, that you would like more philanthropic money put into, more, let's broaden it and say philanthropic effort put into. Let me ask you, Bruce, what you would like to see that well, as. Well, you know, my answer is going to be an urban biodiversity. Um, having said that, though, I, I think there's a range of opportunities there, and one of the significant ones that um, is extremely valuable is investing in youth, whether, it, whether it's through some form of scholarship or work internship or something like that, so that we can build the next generation of researchers and environmentalists, you know, people who can actually get, become part of the ecosystem needed to fix the problem that we've currently got. I won't bugger off overseas. Big <laughs> I won't bugger off overseas. Ah, yeah, as well. As soon as they, you know, hmm. get the that yeah, yeah. degree, yeah, I mean, yeah. we'll, you know, yeah. we need to retain yeah. people. Yeah, well, so um, in some, some restoration projects that I've been working with, um, trusts have been set up which provide employment programs for local people right. and, and embed them back into their community. So, yeah, it's, it's all of this business of capability development and embedding people into the system so that they stay around for the longer All term. Right. Yeah. Short of overthrowing the capitalist system, Aroha, <laughs> uh, what, what area do you think would be most deserving of, of philanthropic money? Well, I'd like to see more money going into um, empowering whānau hapu iwi at local level um, to utilise traditional knowledge to try and see, together with um, Western science, but not always, to look at... Um, ecosystem restoration and also saving of our species. It's an area that's still untapped. Um, we, we don't know the extent to which that could actually provide some really positive outcomes. Yeah. Building capability in the four Cs of um, creativity, communication, uh, cultural capability and communication. 
Could you be more specific? Like they all sound really nice words, but what do they, what do they we mean? We want people to be able to engage to, together to solve these complex problems. All right. Sean? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with that one, actually. I mean, <laughs> I was thinking about, you know, money that's devolved, that's empowering, um, that, that enables action at the community level. Uh, I'd just say, you know, a lot of our philanthropy comes from people who have been become titans of industries. I, I would like to see more of that um, leadership back into the business community to, to really revolutionise the way that our, our industries are really having their impact. Um, and, and tidying things up, actually. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, please thank the panel, ladies and gentlemen.